class consciousness amongst the imprisoned lumpen. By the Maoist internationalist movement Ministry of Prisons. MIM Prisons upholds nation as the principal contradiction in the United States at this time. In that contradiction, we see the oppressed nations as the primary motive force for change. And within the oppressed nations in the United States, we see the lumpen class as the greatest vehicle for revolution. In exploring this last point, we are interested in studying class contradictions, and especially the class makeup and loyalties of the oppressed internal semi-colonies. In addition, in our prisoner support work, we come across lumpen organizations that do not fall within a certain national alignment, leaving class as the common denominator of those organizations. This essay was written for the book on the lumpen class that MIM Prisons has been working on for a few years. We took a break to focus on putting out Chicana Power and the struggle for Atslan, and now that that book is published and distributed, we are refocusing on our analysis of the looping class in the United States. We have already completed a draft of a chapter of the book based on our economic research about the size and composition of the looping class. We are distributing this draft chapter as a pamphlet for feedback. While analyzing economic statistics is a vital part of understanding the lumpen class, the next step is understanding how to influence the class, and hence the class consciousness. We are publishing this essay in under lock and key to spark discussion and ask for feedback. We want to know how you've seen individuals and groups develop lumpen class consciousness. We are especially interested in how lumpen organizations, parasitic or proletarian minded, develop class consciousness among their membership. How does that class consciousness overlap, interact, or even conflict with national consciousness? Please send your reports to under lock and key so we can all learn and grow from your practice. What is class consciousness? Simply stated, consciousness is being aware and knowing what it is you are observing. When you eat, you may be conscious of the chewing and swallowing. Many people eat without being aware of the act of eating. This is parallel to most people acting in a class interest without being conscious of doing so. They just do what is good for them at the time. Consciousness of chewing does not automatically come with eating, and neither does consciousness of class position automatically come with belonging to a particular class. The Revolutionary Anti-Imperialist Movement, RIME, defines class consciousness as, quote, the understanding by members of particular classes that they represent a certain class, that their class interests may intersect or oppose those of other classes, and of their agency when collectively organized for class struggle. Typically, class consciousness is used to describe the most broad, clearest perspective of either the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, or their subclasses. Why do we study class consciousness among the lumpen? We study class consciousness in an effort to shape the lumpen into an alliance with the international proletariat. Without class consciousness, the lumpen acts in ways which strengthen the position of the bourgeoisie. By upholding bourgeois cultural propaganda, e.g. radio rap, participating in self-destruction of oppressed nations, e.g. by selling drugs or fomenting gang divisions, allying with Americans against the international proletariat for patriotic reasons, and the list goes on. National oppression already leaves a persisting impression upon the consciousness of the lumpen of oppressed nations. All of the features of lumpen existence in the United States, police brutality, urban decay, limited job and education opportunities, mass incarceration, etc., are features of national oppression. 
the elements of national oppression that lead the lumpen to the prison doors in the first place are then exaggerated once behind the razor wire. We would be in error to not appreciate that the lumpen has some intuitive grasp of their place in U.S. society. On some level, people of the lumpen class realize they are disadvantaged. Karl Marx said in 1847, Economic conditions had first transformed the mass of the people of the country into workers. The combination of capital has created for this mass a common situation, common interests. This mass is thus already a class as against capital, but not yet for itself. In the struggle, of which we have noted only a few phases, this mass becomes united and constitutes itself as a class for itself. The interests it defends become class interests, but the struggle of class against class is a political struggle. In order for a lasting development to be realized in the lumpen, we need to do as Marx said and become a class for itself, rather than a class blindly working for the bourgeoisie. Our work presently is in studying the contradictions today in our neighborhoods and cell blocks and employing dialectical materialism to create short-range programs in order to push the people in the prisons, barrios, hoods, and reservations forward to reach our long-term goals. We need cadre organizations, liberation schools, youth brigades, and our own press. We need to develop alternative forms of power which rely on the people's independence outside of imperialism's sphere of influence. Time has proven that imperialism and the basic exploitative character of capitalism cannot be reformed, nor can it be made to serve the interests of the people. It can only continue to engender war, poverty, and untold strife at the expense of those neatly tucked away in the periphery. In search of a better way, and in rejection of the comforts of imperialism and its blood money, we must choose which side of the struggle we are truly on. At any particular time, Lumpen, like all people, are either acting in the interest of the international proletariat or in the interest of imperialism. Most Lumpen have no apparent probability of status advancement, so allying with the international proletariat is in the Lumpen's class interest. But if socioeconomic factors were to change and the Lumpen now see opportunity for status advancement, then being allied with the international proletariat becomes class suicide. One socioeconomic factor to take into account is the national question, which is directly related to national oppression and not necessarily economic status. For instance, there are new African and Chicano labor aristocrats whose economic interests are with imperialism, and white lumpen are generally aligned with imperialism and the American nation even though they are imprisoned or their communities are poisoned by mining refuse due to capitalism. Thus, one may be an oppressed new African labor aristocrat, and while aligning with the international proletariat may be viewed in an economic sense as class suicide, in a social sense this alliance would actually improve the probability of status advancement overall and not necessarily be class suicide. Lumpen Unity and Class Consciousness in the U.S. Speaking of the proletariat of his day, Marx pointed out that a common situation existed for the proletarians to unite under common interests. The same could be said about the Brown Berets and the Black Panther Party during the 1960s and 70s. There existed a sharp level of oppression and police brutality within the Chicano communities which inspired the Brown Berets to serve as protectors of their communities as well as reach out to those from other barrios, mainly Lumpen, to join ranks with them by being productive forces for their people rather than common gangsters. The Black Panther Party did a remarkable job building and developing class consciousness among the masses of the new African nation. The BPP was able to tie much needed community programs to the stark material reality of New Africa. Not only were the Panthers feeding the youth through the free breakfast program, they educated the masses on their class position through this altruistic act. 
in one stroke, they were able to secure the trust and gratitude of the people and illustrate the failures of the semi-colonial relationship in which the new African nation is instead. There are glimmers of class consciousness in prison at times, but these episodes ebb and flow due to the bourgeois mindset of much of the prison population. Being raised in a first world country, we are influenced by its culture, although it is not our own. As Mao said in her essay on practice, in class society, everyone is a member of a particular class, and every kind of thinking, without exception, is stamped with a brand of class. The assumption of inevitable imprisonment or death, the glorification of drug and pimp culture, hustling for individual gain while harming our kin, and nihilism are examples of lumpen culture under the influence of the bourgeoisie. At times we may see prison uprisings, strikes, or other prison organizing across national lines, but these events don't usually remain intact for very long. This is because class consciousness does not develop spontaneously. Rather, it must be cultivated and spread through education and agitation. Only through the help of an educated cadre, both inside and outside prison walls, can class consciousness develop. Present day examples of class consciousness development in prison. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels said of class struggle for the workers, the real fruit of their battles lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. Marx and Engels understood that class struggle would continue so long as classes exist. They saw the union of the proletariat as the prize, not what concessions were gained from the ruling class per se. Something similar was experienced with the California prison, hunger, slash work strikes in recent years. The words of Marx and Engels were seen manifested not in a quote-unquote union of the workers, but in a union of the imprisoned lumpen. This union of lumpen produced the agreement to end hostilities. The real victory is in getting lumpen to see and experience that it is really us versus the pigs, and that a concrete force exists which oppresses all lumpen prisoners in some way. These are acts which cultivate an environment where class consciousness can grow. It creates a fertile ground for this process. Within the environment of prison, lumpen organizations are by far more structured and disciplined than they are on the streets. Despite the negative activity and values of parasitic LOs, there is reason to believe that they can operate to achieve revolutionary ends. Pick up any under lock and key newsletter and one will find evidence of LOs working in prison to contribute to the anti-imperialist movement. So it isn't a far-fetched idea to use LOs as revolutionary vehicles in building consciousness among imprisoned lumpen. Lumpen organizations already bring out a form of consciousness within their membership, meaning they instill pride within their own people. LOs in prison are often organized by ethnicity, and in that sense, they develop their national pride, identity, and culture. Their consciousness as a subgroup is raised. This is not class consciousness, and most times not even national consciousness. But it's a start, and more, it's a platform which can be used and highlighted. Most LOs already have an ideological indoctrination process in place for new recruits. Adding class consciousness to the structured education shouldn't be much of a stretch. Class consciousness will only develop so much within an LO, just like a crocodile will only grow so much when confined to a small fish tank. If the LO is engaged in anti-people activities, it is prevented from advancing politically. The parasitic nature of a profit-driven LO will never allow true, unbridled class consciousness to develop because to do so would change the fundamental purpose of that LO. 
This is why growth is one of the five principles of the United Front for Peace in prisons. Comrades must not be discouraged from growing from a parasitic lumpen actor to a class conscious revolutionary lumpen actor. Lumpen organizations and other subgroups can come together to become a whole and thus unite as a class, as did the proletariat in Marx and Engels' day, as did the Russian proletariat unite with the peasantry, uniting two classes, and how Mao Zedong united the peasantry in China upon common interest with the proletariat. When conditions in prison reach an intolerable level of suppression that affects all prisoners as a whole, we will begin to see each other as sharing the same interests of ending oppression behind the walls. Unfortunately, this will not automatically make all prisoners come together in unity. Prison conditions alone aren't a sufficient factor to promote class consciousness amongst the imprisoned lumpen. Practical experience shows that the more repressive the situation people find themselves in, the more likely they are to challenge the situation and find ways to combat it. In some facilities, a wide range of reading material is permitted to be possessed by prisoners, and the pigs aren't readily looking for politically conscious leaders to repress and harass. At first glance, it seems the freedom of movement and association would be a good environment to run political study groups and organize with each other. However, the flip side of having little repression is that many choose to spend more time chasing and idolizing bourgeois lifestyles. Instead of picking up some political lit to read, they choose to discuss Nicki Minaj's ass on the VMAs. How to Organize Class Conscious Lumpen Must Lead The job of class conscious prisoners is to not just understand that change and development is good and inevitable, but we need to find ways to translate this understanding to the broader lumpen masses, and as quickly and efficiently as possible. It is on the lumpen to look beyond the interests of our own to achieve a higher level of political consciousness, and it is on politically conscious prisoners to point out the cause of our problems as well as what's stopping all from uniting. Organize around local experiences slash conditions. There is not a one-size-fits-all solution to awakening the imprisoned looming class. There are many different types of individuals and different backgrounds slash histories and beliefs. And we organizers all have different strengths and operate in varying conditions. But in general, open lines of communication, dialogue, re-education, and finding common ground causes to fight for helps the process. What should be stressed as a development to higher consciousness is the injustices experienced in common. With this sense of having a common injustice done against us, we will be more susceptible to change. If there isn't a lot of immediate suffering to organize around, we can call on our common experiences prior to imprisonment. Even in relatively comfortable prison conditions, we can start by exploring how we came to imprisonment in the first place. The poor quality of teachers in our schools and miseducation given to us by the imperialists is by design. We can then use these direct experiences to organize with others on practical projects, campaigns to improve our collective conditions of confinement, collective legal actions, appeals, literacy, etc., and work to add to the preconditions of class consciousness in prisons. Attempts to integrate politics with a prison struggle will bring a higher level of class consciousness only if we can explain to others how it's not just an isolated struggle within prison we're all confronted with, but the infrastructure behind the prison industry itself, its society, the socioeconomic relations, its effects on our interpersonal relationships and culture, and the world. When imprisoned lumpen begin to unite for common interests, then politically conscious prisoners should advocate for continued struggle. Once any concessions are granted, many tend to think, well, that's all we're going to get. Or they see a tiny concession as a huge victory and step back from organizing. This is a sign of lack of con class consciousness and a lack of internationalism that must be addressed by the present movement leaders head on. Build study groups. We can lead study groups on deeper topics or open debates on anything as simple as a news report. 
Although this may be harder in isolation, it is usually still possible to share material with others in your pod or initiate discussions on the tier. Sharing your views and hearing others can bring many together if a common objective is trying to be reached. It helps to build public opinion in opposition to the bourgeois media outlets. When there are one or two lumpen within every group agitating in this way, along with strong communication in other circles, sharing reading material and legal work, it all works to push their studying into actual work and go from being spectators to actors in the process of transforming these dungeons and the imperialist system generally. There are many topics to study to give a thorough understanding of our class position, including the works of Marx, Mao, Lenin, Engels, and other communist revolutionaries before us. Political economy unlocks the mysteries of the origins and results of class struggle. The bourgeoisie, the owners of the means of production, and the proletariat, those who had nothing so must sell labor power, make up the principal contradiction in the realm of political economy. Understanding these classes and all their subclasses requires one to perform a class analysis so that one understands where people stand on the economic totem pole and determine where the social forces stand. Part of class consciousness is understanding who's on our side and who's trying to imprison, kill, and dismantle us. If we were to utilize the tables out on the yards for educational neutral grounds instead of real estate or casinos, a lot more would be susceptible to change their patterns. One table could be strictly legal work, grievances, lawsuits, etc. One for help with reading, college, and GED. One for addressing the daily issues so that nothing arises to blindside folks. One for political education, etc. These tables would be neutral ground for all nations, LOs, etc. to gain knowledge and put it to use. They would function simultaneously as serve the people programs, and political education meetings, building unity and transforming the lumpen into a class for itself.